everyone. This is Christopher at Indie Gen Con, and anyone who knows me will not be surprised that I would go to a gaming convention and end up talking with two filmmakers. I'm here with Chris Dane Owens and Jason Scholes, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves so you recognize their voices. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's Chris Dane Owens here. Hey there, and I'm Jason Scholes. Now, you two are behind the film that is streaming on Amazon right now, and it is screen. It's has screened or will screen here at Gen Con? It screens tonight at 5.30. However, we did just win Best Picture here at the festival. Excellent. Congratulations. The film is Empire Queen, the Golden Age of Magic. That's right. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, check it out on Amazon the other night. An independent filmmaker often goes for, you know, maybe they go for like a, a, a light drama, occasionally <laughs> a sci-fi, often a horror film because they just really need a good makeup artist, That's you right. know, and everything. You guys go for a a two-and-a-half-hour epic. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, if you're going to shoot for the moon, actually try to hit the moon. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, absolutely. And uh, as I understand it, this whole thing was sort of inspired by a music video. That's right. Um, A number of years ago, I did a music video called Shine On Me, and Jay was a producer and in the video. And the whole idea was that we would create a music video that looked like the trailer to a $100 million fantasy motion picture. We shot it on 35-millimeter film, and... And it did really well for us. It played internationally on television throughout the world. Uh, New Yorker magazine called it the best video of the year at that time. It was featured in Rolling Stone. And uh, Hollywood came knocking and said, this would make a really cool movie. Uh, The costumes, the characters, everything you guys are doing. Have you thought about that? And at that time, it was like, well, you know, it costs so much money to make a film. We'll put a pin in it for now. Well, cut to some years later, we actually found funding. We teamed up with some great uh, producers and technicians. And uh, we have a feature film that's winning in festivals and is on Prime Video and soon to be on um, iTunes, Google Play, and Vudu as well. Excellent. I'll keep an ear to the rail when it does. I'll Thank be sure you. to let everybody know. Uh, now, the music video alone, as you said, it, it looks like... A, a, a trailer to a multi... I mean, the costumes, the set pieces and everything is pretty astonishing and of high quality and everything. Was it... I have to think it was a little difficult to do that then, but was it difficult to then come years later and kind of match that when actually creating the film? Well, I'm not so sure if it was um, difficult. It was actually a, a bit easier because of the advancement of technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... Um, we had already developed the themes of, of the visuals and so forth, so those were already in our mind of what we wanted to achieve, and it's just a matter of going out and finding the costuming and the um, settings to suit that. Uh, but with uh, the digital era coming on uh, in between from when we first did the uh, initial music video, there was another music video in between called Lightspeed, uh, and that one actually showed us that we could do something uh, uh, long form. Uh, for a fraction of the cost of what the initial music video uh, had, uh, what the budget was. So I think in a lot of ways we were enabled to do something uh, very ambitious uh, just by virtue of the times changing. Now, you filmed just in California and I think I read Oregon? Yeah, we actually do have some Hawaii footage as well. So largely Portland, all over California, and a little bit of uh, second unit in Hawaii. Okay, excellent. And a, a lot of the visuals, I, I did recognize what you were talking about with the uh, being able to do the, the digitally, you know, the, the sort of uh, green screen visuals and, and everything as well to kind of help. Uh, yeah, you know, we did have a, a bit of green screen. Uh, that, that's quite minimal, though, relative to the overall film. I think out of the 100 shooting days, 90 of them were in outdoor settings. Uh, and so we probably had maybe three days on green screen stages uh, for some of the castle interiors uh, and so forth. But outside of that, everything is quite practical. Yeah. It, but you, of course, do throw in a really good-looking dragon. No, oh, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, no, and, uh, and um, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, if you can take a visual effect too far, uh, and then it starts to break down. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Chris has uh, articulated it best that Steven Spielberg highlighted that if you show too many frames of Jaws, it just becomes a big rubber shark. <laughs> and so we took the same approach uh, with our visual effects and the dragon of, like, let's just uh, create the feeling for him, give a little a taste of him, but let's not take it too far. Mm-hmm. Now, the film... Um You've admitted it, and it's in some of the presses and everything. It does have uh, little homages and, and shades of things like Lord of the Rings. Uh, Princess Bride, my wife was watching it, and she was thinking, there's a lot of Princess Bride in here. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big influence for us. We wanted to 
figure out what our tone was and stick with it. And for us in our budget range, we thought it's better to have it have a, 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 a sparkle and a, and a tongue-in-cheek element to it as well. So we put a lot of humor in it. And I think all of us on the film uh, love Princess Bride. Yeah. And Harry Potter, too. They, mm-hmm. they have a lot of whimsical humor in that, quirky humor. You know, and we're uh, big fans of such films. You know, so it's the Harry Potter. There's some, you know, Lord of the Rings trekking. There's some swashbuckling uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, you have some oh, yeah, Star Wars. Good, yeah. You know, there's a lot of themes that are quite universal to these types of films. And we embraced uh, all of these types of things. And, you know, there's certain uh, expectations or certain elements that you see repeated throughout these types of films. And I think we hit almost all of them. The wise old wizard oracle character, <laughs> uh, which is our uh, uh, Uncle Rumpleton mm-hmm. and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, very familiar themes put together with our own uh, sensibilities. I even caught, and I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I, my wife and I both went... Was that the Christmas Carol? There was a couple lines where it, it felt very much from like 1951's Christmas. There is Carol. a line there, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that was a. That's an influential film for so many of us. That whole D- uh, Dickens motif of ghost Christmas past and future um, how you, the consequences of your life uh, matter uh, what you do matters and, and I, I'm hoping and I'm glad you guys picked up on that I gotta talk a little bit about the casting of the film obviously you both star but uh, the other casting and not to belittle any of the others I think the entire cast is a lot of fun thank you I think you hit gold with Mary Elise Hayden as your evil queen wonderful thank you oh for that my super Disney grade villain oh she's just she's the look, the attitude, and everything. It's kind of like, you know what? I just want like a prequel film. <laughs> <laughs> What's so cool about that too, Christopher, is she was in the original Shine music video and Lightspeed as one of the evil queens. We, she never spoke. Nobody speaks in the first music video, right? So we didn't really know how dynamic of an actress she or CL Post, our star, was until we got them on camera, started to run dialogue like, oh my gosh, they're, they're wonderful in the film. So that was a, a pleasant surprise, if you will. We're very fortunate to have both of them uh, to carry the the art of acting for us because I don't necessarily uh, think that we always wound up finding the strongest actors for everything but in terms of our lead roles they nailed it for us yeah and well if you've got a really good strong cast a core cast mm-hmm. if, if you have to kind of go to B or C level they'll a lot of them will try to sort of uh, play up to the, to the better Absolutely. actors. Right, no, sure. they raised the bar. And, you know, we had CL with us throughout the entire production, and she was always challenging us, coaching us, and so forth, uh, because she's made this her craft, and mm-hmm. that's her number one passion, uh, whereas we're more the filmmakers. And so, you know, her emphasis being on the, the art of presentation delivery uh, and the thespian side of it, we really appreciate her and Mary both for bringing their A-game to the to the production, which, you're right, did raise the bar for the rest of us. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it could have... They could have very easily went, oh, this is just some pithy little indie. I'm just going to phone it in and do, read my lines. That's but, right. Uh, but they, no, everybody they was... came at it like, like this was, they were working for Spielberg yeah, or somebody. Thank yeah, thank you, Christopher. We appreciate that. And, and I feel like they did that. They felt like we were making something special. That actually took us years to finally get to make it. And through you know, fan enthusiasm, I think they were like, wow, we're really going to do this now. We're really going to make this movie that people have been saying, you guys should make a movie <laughs> for years. And the loyalty of friendship that was established way back in the first music video, followed through with the second one, and it's like, okay, we're going to just carry on with this. And so we became a, a little troop, an tight-knit family in many respects. It's excellent. So what would you think would be, or what did you find to be like the biggest challenge finally bringing this film to life, especially after all these years from the beginning you know, kernel of it? Well, I know I can say that because it's silent, the music videos, when we first started to go like, what do we, what's our voice? What do we sound like? And what is the tone of the film? All that stuff was not really well defined, so we had to work our way through that. To me, that was a challenge. Jay and I shot a scene early on that's not in the movie where we thought, like, let's just see how we can do this on camera. And we made some humor to it, and we, we looked at it, and we said, you know what, this will work. This will be fine. Um, and, and it kept evolving from there. And I would say that, um, you know, Chris coming from the music video side of it, and me coming from a lot of short films, 
you know, we're short, we're used to five minute content or less. So all of a sudden we decided to tackle something that we did not realize would wind up being two and a half hours when all was said and done. Uh, so it was a bit daunting, although we had you know the ambition and the, the belief that we could pull it off. Um, we just had never approached something with such substance before. So going into it, there was, a little, I suppose, a little bit of trepidation or maybe lower expectations of what we'd actually achieve. But as the process started to unfold, especially uh, to Chris's point, after that first weekend, realizing like, no, we can do this. And then uh, getting a bit of funding uh, from our executive producer, Keith to help us kick off uh, the production in earnest. Uh, then we were able to take a trip to Portland, get some epic sceneries, which helped tide us in you know, with, a, with the scope of the world that uh, Chris had originally envisioned. Uh, I was like, you know what? This is possible. And we just kept going and going, and the minutes just kept compiling to winding up. Uh, you know, After four years of filming, we have a two-and-a-half-hour movie. And one of the reasons it's longer is we weren't sure if we were going to sell it as a... Um Series that we would break it into six episodes, or if it was feature, we we basically have both edits. But we loved it as a feature, felt like our pacing was good, and that we're on par with the Harry Potters and the Lord of the Rings as an epic fantasy adventure. Um, And people have been really kind in our comments, going like, look, I saw the running time and I was a little bit daunted by it, but it goes fast, and you guys, your pacing is really good, that it's an enjoyable two and a half hours. We did focus on, you know, the filmmaker's convention that if uh, if it doesn't move the story forward, it shouldn't be in there. Uh, Granted, you can point to a few things and say, like, okay, that was just more or less for the fun of it, Uh, but I think, honestly, most every scene is relevant uh, and does continue to push the story forward, so I don't think we lose our audience in very many places. Plus, in the first movie, you want to do world building, right? You need to say, this is our universe. And so if we do the sequel, knock on wood, it probably won't have quite the same running time. It'll be more like a two-hour project. Um, but you never know. We might just, because we want to go all around the world with it, it might wind up being even longer. We'll see. What was it? The last Peter Jackson one was like nearly four hours or <laughs> yeah, something? So, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, as far as the length, I was the same way when I first... I was, started and like oh this can't be two and a half hours <laughs> they must have some uh some interviews or special features or something at the end of this thing like, no no okay two and a half hours but what's fun is i was never at any point kind of going oh, when will this end you know i was like i was enjoying myself good, i was good. having a good time watching the entire and my wife even stayed up for the whole thing okay <laughs> we're glad it worked out that way because in our minds of course it's how it should be so we're glad that the audience also received it in the way that we intended it to be received and since the pandemic haven't you found that when people are binging they're going like well i watched nine episodes of this show today and i watched eight right. episodes so it's like people have time to watch more and they want to marinate in the world yeah if yeah. we had broken this into a series they would have watched it in the same day yeah it's, mm-hmm. it's very true yeah Right. It is that we intended for it to unfold uh, and no wasted fluff uh, in there. And we did trim things that weren't necessary. You know, I I realize now that there's certain elements, uh, you know, Chris would make, make some edits and I didn't catch the fact that there were certain bits of dialogue missing. And I never missed it and didn't even realize that they were gone. So you realize that there are elements in a film that you can do without. Uh, that initially you might be a little bit married to it, mm-hmm. but uh, at the end of the day, you realize that there is a, a, a leanness that helps to contribute to the final product. And so uh, we did focus on that. I think people might ask, why would a film like this, why would it be screening at, at a gaming convention? And I think the easy answer is like, this really is like a Dungeons and Dragons right. campaign, That's visualized, right. complete with side quests mm-hmm. and, and, and everything. And that made it... I mean, it, it it's probably better than anyone could imagine. Well, you know, and the fact that, uh, you know, we weren't familiar with Gen Con uh, personally ourselves until at uh, WonderCon earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Somebody had mentioned that this could be a fit for Gen Con, so we started doing our research and realized that there was a film component to this festival, uh, to this convention, the film festival. It's like, well, if they have a film component to it, then, you know, clearly we, we should submit ourselves to that and realizing that these are our people. I mean, the fantasy crowd, they, they love it and they embrace it and we could see how they, they would easily want to dress up as an Empire Queen character at some point. Maybe there's an Empire Queen board game even in there somewhere. That's right, yeah. that's right. And for us, we literally got off a plane, got to this hotel, sat down in the room, were there, they started the event, we had been there 15 minutes, 
and they started to go through the winners and we, it, they obviously say best picture for last and we're going well I don't know maybe we won maybe we didn't and then all of a sudden it's like they, they, they show our poster and it's like you guys won best picture it was a really magical moment because we didn't even have time to catch our breath hardly and I didn't necessarily think of this as a festival film in the beginning but uh, I wound up having uh, an itch that I wanted to start submitting it around and uh, we submitted to several festivals and we wound up winning uh, best feature film at the Sweden Film Awards which is like wow you know there is a first validation that somebody out in the audience embraced us in a particular way Mm -hmm. Uh, subsequent to that we've won two Telly Awards one for our musical score and for narration uh, and then now we've just won this next best feature film so it's like all right you know I appreciate the validation of our audience Mm -hmm. And you're getting international acclaim in yes. that, too. And that's pretty impressive for a film that is kind of in the genre that's sort of naturally sort of European. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the sword and scent, the British, the... That's you know, right, Robin old Hood, world or, Europe. Yeah, old, that, old world Europe. And so for a, a U.S. film, especially an independent U.S. film, to be getting the kind of international acclaim and going, no, you guys did good. Well, yeah, that kind of helps boost the, uh, the little ego there and feel like... Make you guys feel like you did a good job. Yeah, it's all, yeah. like Jay said, it's wonderful validation. Um, we've gotten some great comments from people throughout the world so far. And I think that's only going to expand as we increase our distribution. So, yeah, I, that would be the next question is what's next. You said it's going to hit some additional streaming services that's right. soon. That's right. And that will be, be even more global. Um, and, uh, and then... We'll just see. You know, it's all about independent filming. It's not like studio filmmaking where they go, here's your theatrical window. Here's $50 million to promote that window. And then it will go to the streaming services afterwards. We have to, you know, take steps and stumble and um, have victories, uh, triumphs and tragedies along the way. A lot, of, a lot of unanswered calls and emails in relative to trying to get it out there. So, you know, we feel fortunate to be where we're, at, where we're at right now with the possibility of building more. But, you know, it's a process. The distribution process is just as challenging, if not more so, than the production process. We had a wonderful validation early on where Warner Brothers was actually going to handle all of our sales uh, right out of the gate. Nobody had even seen the movie except for the company. And unfortunately, because of the changes within there, that company, we wound up, that deal didn't didn't go through but that was a wonderful like hey you guys I've got good news WB wants to take on the picture then we wound up going to Amazon straight away and that's been a wonderful partner for us Uh, and now we have other partners in place as well and the key to that is just uh, trying to get the awareness so that people will go to these venues and look for us Uh, because uh, you know there's algorithms and all involved with this as well. So, you know, we're hoping to get to the level of like, hey, if you like Harry Potter, if you like Princess Bride, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you'll like Empire Queen. Uh, so we're, we're working out to uh, how do we get to that point where we hit the algorithms properly. I think there's plenty there for a universe to be built. You know, right. you're talking a potential sequel. Or you even half joked about the idea of a, of, of a game, mm-hmm. you know. Absolutely. I'm walking around in the exhibitor's room and everything, and like, there is no reason there couldn't be an Empire Queen uh, tabletop game booth somewhere in. And some Funko dolls. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah Funko's the new action figure. You don't, That's right. You don't look for action figures anymore. You look for the Funko you Give me the That's Funko. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you need a Commander Cross bobblehead. That's now. right. Yeah, That's for right. sure. <laughs> Everybody needs one on the dashboard of their car. <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for sitting down and talking with sure, me. Sure, Christopher, uh, thank I you. I really enjoyed watching the film. Thank you, I, thank I'm you. looking forward to seeing how how the Empire Queen universe expands. That's right. And um, I'll be watching out for you and watching out for you guys, whatever you do in the future. Thank uh, you, Oh, thank you. Really so, appreciate yeah, thank that. Thank you very me much. Too. And thank you for your it's time. It's a privilege to be here.